Good evening, everyone. As we all know, Pastor Dunn is, is up at Trinity this weekend at the Gross, Growth in Grace um, uh, meetings that are going on up there. Um, and we have with us Pastor Steve Hoffmeyer, who will again be in Philippians chapter 1 this evening, uh, preaching from uh, verses 12 to 14. Um, next, our prayer meeting is uh, at its regularly scheduled time Thursday, June 3rd. Saturday, June 5th, that's uh, the men's monthly prayer meeting is scheduled at 7.30 a.m. Next Sunday is our adjusted schedule with the fellowship meal after the morning worship service and then a 2 p.m. congregational meeting where we will go through uh, church finances at, specifically at that meeting and, um, and there'll, there'll be no, um, no evening service. Um, let's see, what else am I missing here? Um, Pastor's Prayer Day is scheduled for Tuesday, June 9th, and then on the Sundays of June 13th, 20th, and 27th, we will have with us Frank Dewana, Ken Harris, and our brother Steve Slater will be preaching um, as Pastor Dunn will be on vacation. So as we um, are, are finished now with our announcements, let's turn in our Bibles to uh, our call to worship this evening, which is in Psalm 1. We're going to read the entirety of Psalm 1, and I ask that we would stand at this time. This is a very obviously very familiar psalm to us that is an instruction concerning good and evil, setting before us life and death and the blessing and the curse. And what is plainly stated here is the different character and condition of the godly and the wicked. So let's read Psalm 1. The psalmist writes, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he will be like a tree, firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Amen. Let's turn in our hymnals to number 446. That man is blessed. Hymn 446.
Let's come before the Lord in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father and our God, Lord, as we read this very familiar psalm, this first psalm in the book of Psalms, Lord, may we be those who are blessed, who are happy, who do not who would not walk with the wicked or stand with sinners or sit with scoffers, but that each day of our lives we would delight in your law. We would meditate in your law day and night with the guarantee that when we use the means of grace that you have given to us, we will be like those trees that are firmly planted by the streams of water. Lord, that we would be, those, we would be such trees firmly planted in the word of God. And that we as your people would yield our fruit in its season. And that as, even as we grow older, Lord, that our, our leaves would not wither. And that whatever we would put our hands to, Lord, that we would prosper. Lord, we know that the wicked are like the chaff, are like the grass that sprouts up and then the, the noon heat hits it and it burns up and it blows away. Lord, let us take lessons from what we see here in this very familiar psalm that we would be like those who are firmly planted by the streams of the water, that we would be blessed in your word, and that as we are gathered here this evening, that you would bless our time, that you would bless our worship, for that is the reason we have gathered together here on this Lord's Day, to worship you, to give you all praise and honor and glory. For you are the God who has created us. You are the God who sustains our very lives. And you are the God who, when we could do nothing because we were sinners and under the wrath of God, you did it all by sending your son, Jesus Christ, into the world to satisfy the law's demands perfectly and yet to go to the cross to die for the sins of his people. And you have given us the gift of faith to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior to the glory of God. And you have given us the gift of repentance to turn from our sins. Lord, we give you all praise, honor, and glory, for we know that this did not come from us. We can't manufacture any of this. We can't do anything. But you did it all. And for this, we give you praise, all praise, honor, and glory. So bless our worship. Bless our time here this evening in everything that we do, that we would magnify and glorify your most holy name. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Two weeks ago, in the first uh, 12 verses of Genesis chapter 32, we read of Jacob as he continues on his journey to Canaan. And tonight, we continue on in our reading of the Old Testament scriptures in Genesis chapter 32. We're going to pick up at verse 13. So in the first first two verses of, of chapter 12, we, we saw, we read of Jacob receiving good tidings from the angel of God, and, and then in verses 3 to 6, he, he sends a message on to his brother Esau, and the response of Esau distresses Jacob so much so that in verse 7 and 8, he divides all that he has into two companies so that if Esau comes and attacks one company, then he will be able to, dis to escape with the other company. And then in verses 9 to 12, we read of, the, of, of his prayers to God for deliverance 
um, because he is, he, he's really distressed that his brother is going to attack. Now tonight, as we pick up the reading in verse 13, uh, and from verse thir- 13 to 23, we read of Jacob sending presents to his brother Esau. And then in, finally in verses 24 to 32, we see Jacob wrestle with the angel of the Lord, with the angel of God. It is here that Jacob is blessed and his name is changed to Israel, meaning he who strives with God. So let's read then, let's pick up our reading in Genesis 32, verse 13 to the end of the chapter. So he, Jacob, spent the night there. Then he selected from what he had with him a present for his brother Esau, 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milking camels and their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. And he delivered them into the hand of his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, pass on before me and put a space between droves. And he commanded the one in front, saying, When my brother Esau meets you and asks you, saying, To whom do you belong, and where are you going, and to whom do these animals in front of you belong, then you shall say, These belong to your servant Jacob. It is a present sent to my lord Esau. And behold, he also also is behind us. Then he commanded also the second and the third and all those who followed the droves, saying, After this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him, and you shall say, Behold, your servant Jacob also is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me. Then afterward I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on before him while he himself spent the night, that night in the camp. Now he arose the same night and took his two wives and his two maids and his eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. And he took them and sent them across the stream, and he sent across whatever he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. And when he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh. So the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him and said, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Penuel, and he was limping on his thigh. Therefore, to this day, the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh in the sinew of the hip. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's take our Trinity hymnal and turn to page 675. We are reading (coughs) consecutively through the London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689. Tonight in chapter (coughs) 8, we are going to read paragraphs 8 to 10. Paragraph 8, being where Jesus applies salvation to us as our mediator 
through the sovereign work of the Spirit. Paragraph 9, Jesus alone is our prophet, priest, and king. And then in paragraph 10, Jesus meets our specific needs in the fullness of his mediating grace. So let's read then on page 675, London Baptist Confession, chapter 8. We'll start at paragraph 8 and we'll read through to paragraph 10 and we will read together. Paragraph 8. To all those for whom Christ hath obtained eternal redemption, he doth certainly and effectually apply and communicate the same, making intercession for them, uniting them to himself by his spirit, revealing unto them in and by the word the mystery of salvation, persuading them to believe and obey, governing their hearts by his word and spirit, and overcoming all their enemies by his almighty power and wisdom in such manner and ways as are most consonant to his wonderful and unsearchable dispensation, and all of free and absolute grace without any condition foreseen in them to procure it. This office of mediator between God and man is proper only to Christ, who is the prophet, priest, and king of the church of God, and may not be either in whole or any part thereof transferred from him to any other. This number and order of offices is necessary, for in respect of our ignorance, we stand in need of his prophetical office, and in respect of our alienation from God and imperfection of the best of our services, we need his priestly office to reconcile us and present us acceptable unto God, and in respect of our adverseness and utter inability to return to God and for our rescue and security from our spiritual adversaries, we need his kingly office to convince, subdue, draw, uphold, deliver, and preserve us to his heavenly kingdom. Amen. Let's come before the Lord once again in a brief word of prayer to receive his word. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, as we would now gather together to hear the word preached, we ask, Lord, that we would be attentive to that word. We ask, Lord, that you would bless our brother as he comes before us and opens up your word as we continue to learn of the ministry of the Apostle Paul and how the gospel went forth into the Gentile world. Lord, may we again see these things and give you all praise, honor, and glory. For even now, today, 2,000 years later, the word continues to go forth. The gospel continues to go forth. And it will have its course. And it will, and, and Lord, we know that there will be those who will hear and respond in faith and repentance. So Lord, we ask that we would learn from the apostle, from his ministry, and be those in this day that would continue to bring forth the good news that God has reconciled sinners to his son, to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and that, and, and that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, bless our time in your word. Grant us grace and strength. Give our brother much um, uh, give him your spirit here this evening as he preaches your word. We pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen.
Let me tell you a little anecdote, or not anecdote, in a fictional, but a real story that happened in the Philippines, oh, some 10, 12 years ago. Uh, there was a tragic accident that occurred as one of our students, we have a ministerial training program there in Manila, as one of our students was returning to his hometown of Naga, which is about an eight-hour drive south of Manila on the National Highway. As he was returning home, it was a rainy night, and there was a little girl crossing the road, looking through the window of the house across the street to the TV, and not looking right or left just as they were coming down the highway. And although in the dark and rainy conditions, he did not see her till the last moment, hit his brakes and hit the little girl. She was about eight years old, broke uh, both legs at, uh, between the knee and the, the hip, took her to the hospital in the town. They really weren't equipped to handle such a case. They brought her to Manila to the, general, the Philippine General Hospital, the National Hospital, where she was put in a cast, uh, immobilized basically from the hip down. Her father came with her to Manila, and he stayed with her while she was in that, those initial stages of recovering. Guess where? At the Moonwalk Community Bible Church in a little room at the back of the building. And while there, well, they attended our church. While there, we had opportunity to show many kindnesses to them. And this young student really thought, I, I, I better give this up. Uh, th this is not working out. I, I'm going back and forth, studying during the week, going back home at the weekend to preach in this little church planting work. Uh, I, 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 this is terrible. I, I, why would God do this? He was ready to give up. I encouraged him to persevere. What happened as a result? This girl and her father came under the sound of the gospel. They went back home eventually to their hometown, which is on the main road about five hours south of Manila, where there was a church planting work. There was an outreach of a sister church. They continued to attend there. Both the parents became members of the church, were converted. One of the sisters was converted. Ultimately, this young girl, as she grew up, went to Manila to work, attended a church. She was converted. Now, tragedy, an accident, horrible accident. A little girl struck by a car. Both legs broken, and after the cast was removed, she thought that was it, but she had to have therapy to learn to walk all over again because she was immobilized for so long. Tragedy. But God uses even awful circumstances. And we're not blaming God for the awful circumstances, but we're seeing the wonder of His grace that He can turn something like that into something positive and good and bring forth good fruit from horrible tragedies even in our own lives. And such was the case of the Apostle Paul in Rome. He's in house arrest, prison. He's not able to move around, not able to go hither and yon and preach. You would think this is horrible. Why would God do this? Why would God allow this to his apostle, the apostle to the Gentiles? He's now hindered. He, the word of God is locked up there in his little place in, in uh, Rome. And he can't go around like he used to. He can't go to cities and bring the gospel to new places. This is the end. This is terrible. Ha. God has a purpose. Let's go back to Philippians chapter 1 and see what the Apostle has to say about these circumstances. And we'll pick up in verse 12. As Paul play a tune on the violin and say, Woe is me, this is terrible, let's pity poor Paul. No, look at what he says in verse 12 of Philippians chapter 1. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ 
has become well known through the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Well, that's not a tragedy. That's a wonderful outcome to terrible circumstances. Well, let's pray that God would help us in our circumstances as they vary. And uh, more or less, we all face tragedies of one sort or another. It's a sin-cursed world. And we're going to face tragedy. What will we do? How will we face it? What will be the outcome? Well, let's pray that God would use us, so use us in such circumstances that he would get great glory to himself. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we consider the Apostle Paul in prison in Rome, we might think your word is imprisoned and that the gospel is impaired in its spread, but we do not think rightly if we so think, because you are God, and you have a sovereign purpose for your glory and for the good of your people and for the glory of your Son, and we trust you. And so we ask that you would make that trust even more operative in our own lives as we face various circumstances which we do not wish and in which we do not delight. But may we see the opportunities that are veiled in the dark clouds and lay hold of them and give glory to you as we face such circumstances in our own lives. And so we ask for your help. Use your word. Encourage your people. And even as we consider our Savior tonight, who endured the cross, despising the shame, but he is now at your right hand, seeing the result of his suffering. Help us to fix our eyes on him, even this evening, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, looking here in Philippians chapter 1, we've read these words. We read earlier this morning, the first part of the chapter, but now continuing on, and I'm, I'm going to skip as I have a selective process going on here. What would be the best thing to give you in one day of a little immersion in Philippians? Well, we're going to, you could read on your own those prayer requests that we, I read earlier, verse 9, 10, and 11. And now we're going to come to this event, God's blessed purposes in our painful trials would be the title if you're into sermon titles, God's blessed purposes in our painful trials. And so what was the trying situation of the apostle, verse, uh, first of all? And then secondly, the blessed fruit, and there are two of them, the blessed fruit of wider evangelism among unbelievers. And then thirdly, the blessed fruit of greater boldness among brethren. And so consider with me these things as we go through. First, first of all, then, the trying situation, Paul refers to it in this way. Verse 12, now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances. Now, are you a little bit astounded by the brevity with which he describes his present condition? How often do we, when we are in, encounter various trials, uh, go to great length and talk about our pain and suffering uh, in those somber tones that tell you we're really suffering and we really have it bad? Let me tell you about my, my pains. Uh, Well, (laughs) Paul just says, I want you to know not about my pains, but about the good fruit of my pains. He just kind of glosses over. He skims right past these circumstances. He just puts it in this way. I want you to know, brethren, that literally it could be translated, the things concerning me, the things about me. I'm not going to talk about the things about me. But I want you to know what the fruit of them was. Well, let's just pause for a moment and think about those things that he's glossing over. In verse 13, he refers to it as my imprisonment. My bonds would be a literal translation. My bonds in Christ. My bonds in the cause of Christ, in the service of Christ. My bonds. Well, what are the circumstances that he's referring to? And we know from the book of Acts exactly what his circumstances are as he pens this letter. Let's turn back to the book of Acts. And by the way, I learned after I did the Sunday school hour in Acts 16 that uh, your pastor is taking you on an overview of the book of Acts. So eventually you'll come to Acts chapter 28 and you'll see something of these circumstances to which he's referring. 
Acts chapter 28 and verse 16, we read, And when we entered Rome, and so we, you assume Luke is with him here, when we entered Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. So there's Paul. He's not in a, locked in a prison. It's not that terrible. He's not with feet in stocks like he was back in Philippi. He's allowed to stay by himself with a soldier. And he refers to this situation as in bonds or in chains. So it seems that while he was with this soldier, they didn't want him on the loose running around Rome. So he has chains. He's chained perhaps to this soldier who is guarding him. And then we come down a little further to the end of the chapter, verse 30 and 31. He tells us more about this circumstance in which he finds himself. And he stayed two full years, Luke reporting, and he, Paul, stayed two full years in his own rented quarters. Who's paying for that? Well, the church in Philippi is contributing. In his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus with all openness unhindered. But he's in his own quarters, still with soldiers guarding him. He can't go around, but when people come to him, he has Bible studies. Bring me the parchments. Uh, he has opportunity to preach, to teach about the Lord Jesus Christ. With all openness, nobody says, I don't want to hear any more about that. Shut up. Don't tell me anymore. Stop this. No more visitors. That doesn't happen. Visitors can come and go, and he's able to preach and teach with regard to the Lord Jesus unhindered. Soldiers are there 24 hours on rotation. Soldiers from the Praetorian Guard, which you might call the Presidential Security Command. Uh, the, the, there, these are important guards, and we'll learn a little bit more about them in just a minute. But think about this. That doesn't sound so bad. But it's still, again, he's hindered from taking the gospel. He was in Rome, or he was heading to Rome because he wanted to go from there to, we know from the letter to the Romans, to Spain. That's not happening at present. He's locked up. So don't forget the hardship. How did he get to Rome? Think about that. Right? He's now in Rome. Sounds like he's not too bad. He's got his own quarters. He's got soldiers guarding him. Not so bad, after all. He can get food delivered, door dash or whatever, and they bring the food in or they cook it for him there. He's got, it seems like he's taken care of. How did he get here? You remember what happened back in Jerusalem? He's there, and he's uh, going to the temple. The Jews mob him and grab him, and they're going to kill him. And he is rescued by the Roman centurion who brings him back to the guardhouse thinking that he's a troublemaker, but he, no, he finds out he's not. He speaks to the crowd. The crowd is stirred up against him. They have a plot to kill him. The Roman centurion finds out about it through God's providence. A little boy who overhears about this tells it to him. And so he is sent to Rome. But of course, before that, he's in prison for a while. Finally, he appeals to Caesar. To Caesar he goes. And how does he get there? So after being in prison back in, uh, in, the, in uh, Jerusalem, or in, I guess it was in Caesarea for a while, he's now going to be sent to Rome. He gets on a ship. And it's a nice sail, nice little journey, you know, cruise ship. No, not quite. He's still got guards. He's still in, under secure uh, restraint. And there's a shipwreck. There's a terrible storm. The sailors want to jump ship. He says, if these men go, you, sa you soldiers are not going to survive. You need the sailors to get you to land. Uh, so the soldiers tell the sailors, his army and navy thing, you're not going to leave. <laughs> and so they stay in the ship. They bring the ship close to land. They all survive. And now the following season they are able to get a ship that brings them towards Rome he gets there shipwreck difficulties he's got guards he's in chains um, he can't go to worship that would have been a heartbreak for him they could come and perhaps be with him perhaps a few joined him on the Lord's day but he couldn't go to worship with the brethren in Rome he's in bonds he says he, he mentions his chains in Acts chapter 28 at verse 20, I didn't read that verse 
He goes back, he says, For this reason I requested to see you and to speak with you, for I am wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of Israel when the Jews come and visit him. <sighs> Chains. Now, I've never been enchained. I suspect you haven't either. Paul was, and he wore that chain for those times when he was in prison, probably from Jerusalem on the ship and back now in for these years, that he's in chains in Rome. But he doesn't go on about the difficulty when we come to Philippians chapter 1. I want you to know that th these bonds, these chains, these circumstances have turned out for blessing. It's turned out for good. I don't want you to know about the, you know, the sores that are on my wrist from where the shackles are on my wrists. I don't want you to know about the difficulty sleeping when you've got a soldier chained to you. I don't want, that's, I'm not here about that. He's not playing that sad tune. He's not singing the blues. I've got it so bad. It's really so bad. It hurts so bad. You don't get that tune. You get the joyful tune. And again, in this letter, how many times? You, oh, there's a little homework assignment. Count how many times the word rejoice, joy, joyful is in this letter. It's not just a handful. It's, it's, it's several times he brings that up. And now here he wants them to know that my circumstances have turned out for blessing. Commentaries suggest that the word progress, my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, that... Uh, they suggest this word progress refers to the advance of an army against stiff opposition. Not, a, you know, not an easy fight, not a pushover. The advance of an army, but there's stiff opposition. Think of the opposition of the Jews back in Jerusalem. They want to kill them. They've got a plot. Think of the opposition uh, along the way. Think of these Jews even in Rome, that some of them were not happy with him being there. He's got opposition from the Roman authorities. Even back in Jerusalem, when he's brought before the king, he said, well, if he hadn't appealed to Caesar, he could have been set free, but let's send him to Caesar. It's like a whitewash. They're, they're, they're trying to get him off their hands. They don't want to take responsibility. He had difficulties, but they're also false teachers. Now he's in prison. And they're going around to the places where he preached. You find this in the letter. You find this in other New Testament letters. And they're trying to undermine and undercut his influence. Go to Corinth. And you've got people claiming to be apostles. There are all sorts of oppositions. But Paul's not majoring on that. He's talking about the blessing. And so you ask, Paul, you're in prison. You're locked up. Okay, you're chained. You can have your, so a little freedom. You can have guests. You can have visitors. You can have the food that they order or cook for you. But what's good about it? What's the blessing? Paul, tell me how this has turned out for progress. I find it hard to believe. Progress when you're in prison? Let me tell you, he says. I'll tell you. And so there are two things, especially, that demonstrate the progress of the gospel while Paul is in chain. And so the first fruit is the blessed fruit of wider evangelism among unbelievers. Now, first of all, he mentions the guards. He says, My imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. My imprisonment has become well known. Now, the Praetorian Guard was composed of, as I've researched and found out, uh, as far as we know, nine cohorts of a thousand soldiers each. Now, of course, not all of these thousand soldier cohorts would have been on duty in Rome at any given time. They were sent out on special missions, special forces, uh, various places in the empire. But there would have been at least one of these cohorts there because they were also employed in guarding Caesar's household. And of these cohorts, there would be a few assigned on rotation to be chained with Paul, guarding this prisoner. And so a rotation is put in place. Uh, this man is here this day, and so on and off. How many hour shifts? I don't know. But they're rotating in and out with Paul there in this 
uh, rented quarter guarding this very desperate criminal. Well, these remember, these soldiers, they're on rotation from service in the provinces back to Rome. They've seen hard service. They've seen battle. The Roman Empire was never, even with the Pax Romana, was, always, was never at peace totally. There were always border skirmishes. You know, the Persian side was never totally peaceful. Going up north among those uh, Goths and Visigoths and whatever Goths. Well, they, these men saw hard service. Now you got these tough soldiers. Maybe they thought of this, oh, this is going to be easy. I just have to sit here, guard this one guy, and with a chain, he's not going anywhere. Okay. And then this man, Paul, has visitors. visitors. We read a bit back in the book of Acts how visitors would come and they would sit with him. And so we, I read the verse 20. Let's go back to Acts 28 and just see how this transpired. Acts 28 and cha- uh, verse 20 said, for this reason, the Jews are come to him, is telling them the story. Uh, let's go back to verse 17. And it happened that after three days, so he's now there with the soldier guarding him, he called together those who were the leading men of the Jews. And when they had come together, he began saying to them, Brethren, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they had examined me, they were willing to release me because there was no ground for putting me to death. But when the Jews objected, there's another factor, I was forced to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any accusation against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I requested to see you and to speak with you, for I am wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of Israel. And they said to him, We have neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren come here and reported or spoken anything bad about you. So the news had not yet come to Rome. But we desire to hear from you what your views are. For concerning this sect, they had heard about Christians, it is known to us that it is spoken against everywhere. But here you have a Jewish rabbi, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He's got credentials. He's got experience. He knows from the inside what this sect is about. So tell us your views. Let, give it to us straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So when they had set a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in large numbers, and he was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets, from morning until evening. All day Bible study. Out of the Old Testament, that was their Bible. So he's got the law of Moses, he's got the books of Moses, he's got the prophets, he's showing that Jesus is the one spoken of in those prophecies. He's the promised one. He's the coming Messiah who has already come. So he's trying to convince them, persuade them concerning Jesus. What's the fruit? Verse 24. And some were being persuaded by the things spoken, but others would not believe. But now, let's go back. We're going to come to the Jews in a minute and what was the fruit there. But think now about the soldier chained to Paul, captive audience. He's stuck there. All right, Paul's got these Jews. He's talking to them about Jesus. Guess what the soldier's doing? Well, maybe he's thinking, huh, these religious nuts. He's a soldier. Probably foul mouth, probably crass, probably rough individual, like we know generally. You may have relatives who are in the armed services. I'm not talking about them. But you know the reputation of soldiers. And then this, he's with Paul on and off. As his rotation comes, and he says, this man is under threat of death. He's facing trial before Caesar. And he's not complaining. He's not arguing. He's not seeking to get people on his... He's talking about this Jesus. This man who died, and he says, rose again. And he says, changed his life. What is it with this? And so as these men rotate on and off and they're hearing him talk about Jesus to all who were coming from day to night, from night, morning till evening, something happens. As he says back in Philippians chapter 1, that he was, his 
being imprisoned in the cause of Christ was now becoming well known through the Praetorian Guard. Uh, so this man, he's now off duty, he goes back to the barracks. He tells his buddies, this, you know, this prisoner, he's different. We've guarded a lot of people uh, that we were ordered to guard. And of all the men I've guarded from various walks of life, different crimes, different situations, I've never met anybody like him. And he's, he tells me, as he's spoken to these other people I've listened, couldn't help but listen, that it's all because of this man, Jesus, that he says died and rose again. And he says this man is not just a mere man. But he's the son of the living God. I'll tell you what, I don't know much about that Jewish religion, but this man's got something real. He tells his buddies back at the barracks. They go on rotation. They meet Paul. And they find out. And some of these men get rotated in other positions. You see, God's doing something here. You think you locked up the gospel? Guess again. Not happening. And so, can you think, as this letter is now going back to Philippi, and it's talking about the Roman cohort, the, the Praetorian guard, that now they're finding about Jesus from this prisoner Paul, can you think of a certain man back in Philippi who gets his big grin on his face when the letter's being read? <laughs> I know about that guy, Paul. You guard him, something's going to happen. <laughs> I, I, it makes me smile. Uh, but this, this letter is telling about it going all over. You, we've heard this story before. It's happening again, now in Rome. And so he says, this being locked up for the cause of Christ, God is using it for good here in this Roman Praetorian elite presidential command guard unit. All right, now, this says, back, going back to Philippians 1, he says, My imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian guard and to everyone else. So in other words, it didn't just stop there. To everyone else. Well, of course, there were the Jews. I mentioned them. We read about them back in Acts chapter 28. What was the result? Well, I read the verse. Some of them... We're being persuaded. That's verse 24 of Acts 28. But others would not believe. Now think about it. These Jews come to him. We've heard about this sect. It's spoken against everywhere. Christians? Followers of this Jesus Christ? All right, well, tell us what you know about it. And he says, okay, I'll tell you. I fought against that. I tried to persecute those Christians until one day, and he tells them the story. I met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and I found out that he is the Son of God. He is what he claimed, and he did die, and he did rise again, because I met him. I met him on the road to Damascus. It's true. It's real. And he changed my life. And so they learn about, Paul, uh, about Jesus from Paul. And some of them believe. The most ardent persecutor, excuse me, of the Apostle Paul in his ministry were the Jews. But, of course, he met opposition from the, the uh, slave girls' owners and from the um, idol makers there in Ephesus. But he met a lot of opposition from Jews. And here they are. And some of them believed. But it also says to everyone else. At the end of the letter, turn back in Philippians chapter 4, verse 22. What happened with this Praetorian guard thing? He closes the letter in this way. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Now, wait a minute, Paul. You're, you're chained there in your quarters. How does the gospel get to Caesar's household? The saints are in Caesar's household. Now, does that mean his household servants? Does that mean his wife, his kids, uh, his in-laws? I, I don't know, but it's his household, which would include servants. 
of various positions, but it has penetrated Caesar's household. How did that happen? Let's trace the, you know, the spread of this gospel virus. There's a super spreader event happening right there in Paul's rented quarters. It goes to the guard. The guard goes back to the barracks. He tells his buddies in the barracks. Perhaps he gets now rotated to a new position guarding Caesar. He's there in Caesar's household, this believing guard. And he's telling the maids. He's telling the, the cook. He's telling others in the household staff. And they're converted. Yeah, that, that's what it says, doesn't it? I'm not reading too much in there. God has his purposes, even in our trials. And then it says, in, back in verse 12, 13, and to everyone else, it seems like the news is spreading through the city. Perhaps in the headlines of the uh, Rome Picayune, uh, the, the local journal. This man, Paul, in prison, accused by the Jews, for what? For preaching Christ. And people are being changed. Is that, again, too much? Perhaps. But the news is spreading in the whole city of Rome. And so our conclusion is, when we consider that the guards are saved, the Jews are saved, uh, how, Caesar's household is penetrated, that God is using this mightily for the spread of the gospel to reach people that otherwise would not have been reached. The soldiers, not an easy group to penetrate. <laughs> and they get chained to Paul. God has a purpose. But then let's think of the next blessing, and this would be our third point, the blessed fruit of greater boldness among the brethren. And we find this in verse 14, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Most of the brethren, I was talking about the brethren in Rome. Most of the brethren, because there's a church already there, we know that he wrote the letter to the Romans from Sincrea, which is a city outside of Corinth. And so he's in that Corinthian area when he writes the, the letter to the Roman church, a church that was not planted by him, but as it is the megalopolis, the capital, uh, all roads lead to Rome. And just like in the Philippines, when people from the provinces want to get ahead, they go to Manila. Well, if you're in the Roman Empire and you want to get ahead, you go to Rome. So people are streaming into Rome from the provincial areas, and some of them are Christians. And the gospel comes to Rome, and we find there's a Roman church in that letter to the Romans, not planted by Paul, but it's already there. They learn of what's happening. And what would be the initial response? The Apostle Paul. We know him. He wrote to us. He's in prison. For what? What's the charge? What did he do? He preached about Jesus. Oh, no. You mean you could get locked up for preaching about Jesus? Now, when Paul writes here and he says, Trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage. Again, I don't believe that. I, I think there's an implied contrast here that when they first heard, there's fear. When they first hear of his imprisonment, in fact, in verse 28, he says, In no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but salvation for you, and that too from God. There are opponents to the church in Rome. Don't be alarmed. Well, it seems they were being alarmed. And so there was this tendency for them to be afraid. Wouldn't you be afraid? You, you hear of Christians being locked up, but say in China. Okay, let's go underground. Let's go to the catacombs. Let's circle the wagons. Let's be, uh, and of course, it's wise to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, to be uh, careful in our method of evangelism. Think of our brethren in Muslim countries. It would be unwise to stand on the streets of Karachi Pakistan, uh, in Pakistan and preach the gospel. You'd probably not, I, I would not have your life insurance policy. I wouldn't sell it to you. That's uh, dangerous. You have to be wise. But still, 
Should we circle the wagons? Should we just shut up? Should we hide our Christianity? Hide it under a bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine. And so these people in Rome have that tendency to think, okay, the gospel is in prison. The gospel cannot advance. There are many adversaries, strong and mighty adversaries. Circle the wagons. Let's pull in. Let's hide. Let's go in the catacombs. But what does Paul say about adversaries? He says in 1 Corinthians, a wide door for effective service has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. It's not an either or. You have a wide door for service and many adversaries. Okay, do you have adversaries? You get laughed at for your faith? If people say that's, that's you know, unbelievable, you believe that Bible? Many adversaries. But don't take that as a sign you shut up. There may be a wide door for service at the same time as you have many adversaries. But now, although that may have been their initial response to be afraid, to kind of uh, shut down, to go in hiding, but now they see the result of Paul's imprisonment. It says, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment. So now they see that because Paul's in prison, the gospel has penetrated the Praetorian Guard, Jews, some of the Jewish community there in Rome that previously said this sect is spoken against. Don't, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Now they've been converted. Some of them have joined them. And even Caesar's household. And they stop and think, well, you know, this imprisonment stuff, I don't want to be in prison. You don't either. But if God uses it for the spread of the gospel, the advance against opposition, God's on his throne. God has this. He knows what he's doing in putting me through this circumstance or that for his glory and for the advance of his kingdom. So as a result, verse 14, they have far more courage to do what? To speak the word of God without fear. So their lips are opened, their tongues are unloosed, And they're speaking boldly about their Savior. And so God is able to use the most black, bleak, dark circumstances in our lives for his glory. And what Paul had written to them some years before in Romans 8, 28, they got the letter. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. It's true. Look at Paul. All things, even imprisonment, for good. And so, that's what we learn. Paul's circumstances, he's he's in chains. Blessed fruit of the spread of the gospel in ways that would have been unimaginable. Blessed fruit of the brethren being strengthened in their hearts, in their inner man, to stand up for Jesus, soldiers of the cross. And so, how do we wrap this up then, this evening? Well, first of all, first application is don't merely look at your circumstances, but look at the purpose of God, which is not always evident. Our student, as I mentioned, was ready to quit. He thought, well, this happened. And about that same time period, it was while he was studying, his father passed away. And then a month later, his mother passed away. And he was very demoralized. Spoke with him, encouraged him. He stuck with it. And now there's a church in Naga, a small church, smaller than your church, But there's a church where the gospel is proclaimed in the city of Naga in the southern part of Luzon where it wasn't before. God's goodness. And not only that, but this family, the the little girl's family, 
they're contributing members. I was invited to speak at one of the anniversaries of that church there in that city, that town on the uh, National Highway going south, and saw what God had done. And there was this, this family singing the praise of God in their midst. So don't merely look at your circumstances. Look at God's purpose. What does God have in this? Oh, I've got a condition. I've got to be operator. I've got to be in the hospital. Well, you know, you have contact with doctors and nurses there that otherwise you would not have met. Hmm. Never thought of that. And are they there just to serve you? Not just. They might be chained to you, <laughs> at least before you're put under sedation. Uh, you have an opportunity to speak to them. And God opens doors. Pray for that, that God will help you recognize that open door. Uh, y y some idiot bumped your car. Where were you looking? Wait a minute, cool down. God's got this. Is it an opportunity? Yes. You wouldn't have met that guy. I saw a bumper sticker once. Let's not meet by accident. <laughs> but in God's providence, you might. These unpleasant, undesired circumstances can be opportunities for the spread of the gospel. So look for those opportunities. Look for a way. Pray about it. And I don't know all of your circumstances. I know some of you have faced various diseases, surgeries, and so on. Um, maybe with the, you, you, you have a job change, and so you're meeting new people. These are opportunities to bring the gospel into new circumstances. And this is something that I realized when I became a pastor. You come behind the pulpit, and your opportunities for meeting ordinary people are diminished. When you're out in the workplace, in the office, you have all kinds of opportunities. When you're behind the pulpit, you're okay, I can preach the gospel to many people week by week, but I don't rub shoulders with a lot of other people, but you do. You're there. So remember, while you respond to various circumstances, there are people watching you. There are people observing. How do you react? Do you lose your cool? Do you fly off the handle? Do you rant and rave? Do you moan and groan? Or do you say, okay, God, what's, what's your purpose here? You've got this. I'm in your hands. Underneath are the everlasting arms. A text which I come back to. The everlasting arms. They don't drop. They don't grow weary. What is God's purpose for me in this? And think of our Savior, and it was not uh, in my notes, but as this is uh, in preparation in a way for our Lord's Supper, think of our Savior. Tragedy of greatest tragedies is, is, is the cross. An innocent man, holy, harmless, undefiled, had done no wrong. Why? What evil has he done? It was the question of Pilate. Crucify him, was the answer. And yet, this tragedy has brought about our salvation. Who endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. More than conquerors, he makes us, because he's more than a conqueror over sin and death. So as we come to the Lord's table, think of this. What our Savior endured in tragedy results in praise and glory to God and our salvation. So when our tragedies come, what can God do with this? And, you know, if you endure tragedies without the Savior, what good is that? Only this, if it might drive you, draw you to the Savior. And may that be the outcome. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for such a Savior. We thank you for him who endured such 
animosity of sinners against himself, all to save sinners such as we are. And we, as we thank you for him, we thank you for the Apostle Paul, for his endurance of these circumstances, the things concerning himself, for the cause of the gospel. And we are here because we're those who endured in order to bring the gospel to us. And we ask that you would use us as your instruments, even in trials, even in the difficulties of this sin-cursed world, facing unfair circumstances, painful circumstances, that you would use us to shine light in this dark generation. We ask through Jesus our Savior. Amen.